So our next speaker is the keynote speaker for the first keynote speaker for the conference this year. Um, he may be well known to many of you, unless you came in the last two years, because he wasn't here. Um, but he was very busy doing what he's going to talk about this afternoon, which is the two shipwrecks, um, two and a half thousand meters underwater with six 3D cameras. Dr. Woods is a research engineer at the Center for Marine Science and Technology. And as of two years ago, manager of the high facility there too, which is a very nice 3D display system. Uh, it says here he has a strong background in stereoscopic 3D imaging. I think he has an excellent background in stereoscopic 3D imaging, not just a strong background. Um, and if you have any questions about stereo 3D, sit next to him at the dinner tonight and ask away. Um, and he's done lots of things which we're going to learn about um, right now, I believe. Andrew. So thank you, Nick, for the introduction. Um, my talk to today will be about a project I've been working on for the past four years and uh, um, was the result or, or was the cause of me not, a, not being able to attend the last two conferences. So uh, um, that had a, a negative effect on my attendance percentage. Prior to that, it was um, every conference but two. Now it's every conference but four, which makes it 23. All right, so I'll be talking today about um, a project um, relating to two shipwrecks, the, HS, H, sorry, the HMAS Sydney 2 and the German vessel, the, the Cormoran, which are sitting at 2,500 metres underwater. And uh, we took a, a, a huge suite of equipment to conduct a 3D imaging survey of the two vessels. Um, Taking you back to World War II, the 19th of November in 1941. This is just a few weeks before Pearl Harbor. Um, these two ships were in the Indian Ocean and it, an unlikely encounter it was. Um, no one expected a German raider to be um, located in this part of the world, on the west coast of Western Australia. Um, the German vessel, the Cormoran, was trying to establish a, basically a, a bit of a distraction from what was occurring in, in, the, in Europe so that um, uh, the Allies could not just send all of their, uh, all of their vessels to, uh, to Europe to, to fight the war there. So the, the Cormoran was uh, moving around, creating a bit of distraction and uh, um, ensuring that uh, um, the navies around the world had to keep some of their vessels in their home waters. So the Cormoran was a, a merchant vessel originally and it was outfitted with um, a wide range of um, heavy artillery. Um, the Sydney II, in contrast, was specifically built um, in Newcastle upon Tyne, Nick, um, uh, to be a, a, a leading class um, warship of the time. Um, the, the German vessel was... was at the time, getting ready to lay some mines in a, a port on the West Australian coast. And the Sydney was heading down south, heading down from Singapore, heading back, to, back, back down to Fremantle, and um, um, encountered this unusual vessel that uh, was out of the normal shipping lanes. Um, cutting a long story short, basically a, uh, a very short and violent action occurred, resulting in the sinking of both vessels. This is the crew of the uh, HMAS Sydney just after it had a, a very um, glorious win in the, uh, in the Mediterranean. Um, most of these crew, but you know, certainly all of the, the crew that were on the vessel at the time of the encounter with the Cormoran perished, 645 souls. Um, Whereas on the Cormoran, um, they were carrying 380, and uh, of those, 318 survived. So there was 70 years of controversy and rumour about what had actually happened on that day. Um, the Sydney was on, in radio silence at the time it went down, so there was, there was no um, uh, radio communication to indicate why it had gone missing. And uh, when search party was sent out for it. Um, the, the search parties only find, found German survivors. The two ships were found in 2008 
by a consortium um, called the, the Finding Sydney Foundation um, and supported by uh, a range of different uh, contributors, including the federal government. Um, the, the two vessels were, were found here on the West Australian coast. Um, so Perth is way down here, Singapore is up here somewhere, and uh, the location where they were found was just here. They were planning, the Cormor was planning on laying mines in this uh, harbour here called Carnarvon. And the, the locations, the exact locations of the two wrecks were found around 200 kilometres off the coast and around 20 kilometres apart from each other. So the action occurred obviously together and uh, as part of the, um, um, the process, the, the Sydney sailed over the, uh, the horizon away from the Cormoran, which was disabled, but eventually it sank as well. This is a side scan sonar image of the, uh, of the Cormoran site. The main wreck is, is sitting right here. Um, there's a whole lot of uh, debris um, in this region here which looks like just salt and pepper on a, a side sand sonar image. And uh, rather bizarrely, the engine is sitting over here. The, the reason for this rather unusual arrangement of the site is that the, the Cormoran was carrying 300 sea mines and uh, its crew scuttled the vessel before they abandoned ship and those sea mines went up in a huge explosion which just tore the vessel apart. Um, the Cormoran... What's left of the Cormoran is about 40% of the, uh, the vessel, the, the bow section, um, sitting nicely upright on the sea floor, but the rest of it is just this torn metal and just lots of little pieces. The Sydney is a very different site, a um, bit more compact. Um, the main hull is here, around probably 95% of the vessel is still in one piece. The bow is sitting upside down further up in the debris field, about 300 metres away. Um, the Sydney was hit by a torpedo from the Cormoran and uh, that damage eventually led to the, the separation of the, um, the bow from the main, uh, the main hull. And then there's a whole lot of other items on the seafloor which, which got essentially torn off the superstructure of the vessel as it went down. It's a very violent action. You might think of it being nice and um, gentle uh, a sinking process, but no, it's actually quite violent with uh, lots of uh, movement and uh, the um, items just being torn off the, the superstructure. So the 2008 exp expedition, which, which found the two vessels, um, again, they, were, they, were, they sunk in 1941, so it was almost 70 years before they were finally located, um, was very successful in, it, in its aim of finding the two vessels. They also sent an underwater vehicle down called an ROV um, and collected around 1,500 images and around 40 hours of video. And those, that information fed into a commission of inquiry um, which ruled on the loss of the two vessels and they, uh, um, uh, one of the scientific organisations in Australia, DSTO, also performed a detailed analysis on all the, the damage which was visible on the two vessels as well. Um, when we look, went to look at the archive that was collected, um, we realised that although it was useful for that purpose, um, for any subsequent purpose such as a museum exhibition or uh, 3D processing, um, the still images were relatively low resolution, 5 megapixel, but uh, the lighting was relatively low so there was a lot of uh, blurring as well. And the video was only standard definition, so uh, um, 0.3 of a megapixel. Um, and the lighting, again, was, was um, not sufficient to provide uh, good quality of vision, and that was also corrupted by noise and interference. So there was a de desire from um, my, a colleague and myself, Andrew Hutchison and myself, to uh, um, mount a mission to return to the two wrecks to image them in, in uh, um, considerable detail. So rolling forward to 2015, um, after four years of... Uh, toil after the um, initial seed of the thought to uh, conduct this, this project. Um, we conducted the expedition in April, May of last year to return the two wrecks. Our aim was to image the wrecks in exquisite detail. It's an extremely 
rare and valuable opportunity to, to, to return to these two wrecks. So we wanted to, to really image them in, in such detail and in so many different ways that we would be able to generate lots of different data products from, uh, from the project. Absolutely key to the project was this vessel here provided by an offshore um, oil and gas services company called Dof Subsea. This is the Scandi Protector, the latest in offshore oil and gas vessel, um, 100 berths, helicopter pad, huge back deck, huge crane, and importantly for us, two underwater vehicles, work class, the top of the range um, for their capability as well. The existing lighting and camera systems that are used on these vehicles for the for normal oil and gas operations were not quite the level and brightness and resolution that we were wanting for our mission. So uh, um, I led the development of a, a, a very complicated custom lighting and camera system um, to be fitted to the front of both of these vehicles and I'll, I'll spend the next few slides going in detail through those. We also had a multi-beam sonar on the, uh, on the, on the RO, one of the ROVs as well, which um, allowed us to capture images such as this. This is a multi-beam scan of the HMAO Sydney. You can see the torn off bow on, on this end here. And this mission to return to the two wrecks also provided a unique opportunity to allow us to collect some science samples as well. And uh, we collected rusticles, we collected uh, push cores, water samples, and also some biological samples as well. The core project team uh, were from Curtin University, Andrew Hutchison, myself, Joshua Hollick, and uh, Tim Eastwood from the Western Australian Museum led the, their um, activities, their involvement. So each of the two ROVs, as I mentioned, were equipped with a custom 3D imaging system. The ROV is what's sitting behind here. Um, there's a, what looks a bit like a top hat sitting on the top here, with, which is what's called a tether management system. And there's a big reel of umbilical cable on there. Um, the, the system that we attach to the front of these two vehicles um, consisted of 10 underwater LED lights. Um, the ROV had three kilowatts of power available on its lighting circuit, so we used all of that and uh, pr um, produced roughly 200,000 lumens of light. We also fitted seven digital still cameras to the front of the vehicle. Um, it's quite rare to have a or a single digital still camera on an ROV, surprisingly. Um, so we had um, seven on each. Um, two 3D high definition video cameras. Uh, I should also mention that one of, or two of the digital still cameras were mounted as a stereo pair. Uh, there's not enough plugs on a regular ROV for those many cameras. So uh, we also had to have um, some subsea um, interface bottles. Um, this one here is for interfacing all of the camera systems. And these two um, um, housings here are for the uh, lighting distribution. All of that was mounted on a special frame. The frame was hydraulically controlled so that it could be either um, oriented vertically, for example, when we were filming the, the hull of the vessel, or it could be leant forward at 45 degrees when we were photographing the superstructure of the, the vessel or flying across the, uh, the items in the debris field. And of course, there was two of these. It was a hell of a lot of equipment. And we had a scary amount of underwater cable as well that joined all of these different systems together. Now to go in, into a bit more detail into the, uh, the camera systems that we used, I guess this is a bit like uh, camera porn for uh, stereographers. Um, on the first ROV, we had a Kongsberg um, Full HD 3D high definition video camera. Um, on the second ROV, we had a 3D high definition video camera from Bowtech. Um, on both ROVs, we had a secondary 3D high definition camera from a company called Subsea Imaging, 
uh, near Halifax in Canada. And we also developed um, our own 3D digital still camera for the project as well. Um, the top cameras provided a live 3D high definition feed up to the surface and uh, those recorded continuously. We had a boxes and boxes of hard drives. Um, the second row of cameras provided um, additional capability as well as redundancy in case we had a problem. We also had uh, these ones provided 3D zoom, uh, provided a standard definition preview to the surface, um, but recorded internally, so we had 47 hours of recording capacity on those. And um, these particular cameras here um, were um, capturing a stereo pair every five seconds and we're recording to uh, um, internal memory as well. A little bit more of a look at uh, each of the cameras here. Um, the, the Kongsberg camera outputs a, what's known as a HD SDI output, full high definition 1920 by 1080. This one's got a lens separation of about 60 millimetres and um, a 3000 metre um, depth rating. Um, at, at this depth, two and a half thousand metres, you know, it's a substantial pressure, so you, uh, you need uh, high quality housings. These ones, this one here was made out of titanium. Uh, the camera from, from Bowtech has a slightly wider lens separation, 76 millimetres, um, fairly wide field of view. This one's rated for 4,000 metres and again made of titanium. The cameras from Subsea Imaging, they're based on a, a Sony um, 3D camera module and uh, that has a, a 32 millimeter camera separation and um, one of these had a stainless steel housing the other one had a, a, a titanium housing and again um, rated for roughly 3,000 meters. And then this camera here, um, quite a bit heavier because it was made out of stainless steel, about 10 kilograms in air. Um, but also rated for 3,000 metres and uh, um, captured images uh, with uh, se about 75 millimetre separation and uh, 12 megapixel resolution. So that's all the 3D cameras. And then we also had these uh, digital still cameras as well. Um, these are a 10 megapixel digital still camera also from Kongsberg. Um, these cameras have an ethernet interface, so we had full data um, control and download from the cameras. Um, one of the, um, the aspects we were quite proud of, we, we developed some, uh, or more specifically my colleague Joshua Hollick, developed some um, customised code which allowed us to have real-time download of raw images um, from the cameras um, in real time um, and everything was capturing digital still images at five images per second. Um, and these also have zoom capability. And to that, we also had some digital, um, wide angle digital still cameras, um, again at a five second interval, and these ones were recording internally. And the wide angle provides um, additional 3D reconstruction geometry capability, which uh, I'll mention a little bit more a bit later. And um, the ROVs are outfitted with some existing video cameras as well. So we were recording much of that content as well. Um, so that's the subsea end up on the surface on the vessel. Um, we had a, a control room. This particular room was, was empty when we arrived and within 12 hours we had all of this set up and, and running. Um, so it's um, um, broken down into several stations or consoles. Um, we've got uh, a, a control system here or a control station here for the lights and cameras on ROV1. Um, three laptops controlling um, a range of different functions, controlling the lights, controlling the cameras and um, a, a, an image preview function here so we can see the images as they were downloading from the, uh, the Ethernet um, uh, connected cameras and we also had a, a video preview of the other cameras and then a live high definition 3D video feed on this particular monitor here. Then that configuration was repeated here for the second ROV control station. 
another station here for the high definition video recording and data storage, and then a third con sorry a, a, another console over in the corner there for data validation and, and some initial data processing to ensure that the uh, the data we were collecting was was um, um, up to scratch. Over behind this wall is the actual room where the ROVs themselves are flown. Um, here's the control station for ROV1, two pilots and a whole lot of different video monitors showing all sorts of uh, uh, different video feeds and, and, and control um, status. Um, on the other side of the room behind the camera is the control station for ROV2 and uh, on the left is the, uh, the, the navigation control station. So it's, uh, it's a bit like mission control. Of course, gluing all of this equipment together was um, um, the, the, cl the crew. We had a, a wonderful team. We had 20 people, um, um, part of the, uh, the Curtin and WA Museum team, uh, running the, uh, the imaging systems. There's another 20 people who run the ROVs and then another 20 or so people who run the vessel. Um, so a, a team of approximately 63 on board. We're at sea for, for nine days. Four of those were um, um, actually diving on, the, uh, diving on the two wrecks. And uh, um, so it was uh, a very busy operation. Um, bringing this all together was, was a huge effort. We, had, um, uh, we, we were very pleased with the amount of support we had from industry. Um, so many different companies from the oil and gas industry were um, uh, very keen to be involved. It was such a uniquely different project to what they would normally be working in. They were very keen to see their services and products being demonstrated in a, a non-oil and gas um, uh, type of um, application. So the primary project partners were the Western Australian Museum, Curtin University, DOF Subsea who provided the vessel and we also received a, federal gra a grant from the federal government. So in terms of the results of the expedition, as I mentioned, we had two ROVs working for four days straight in the uh, diving on the, the two vessels, 24-hour operations, and we had 12-hour rot rotating shifts. Um, over that period of four days, we surveyed both wreck hulls and also the, the, the um, sections of the debris fields. Um, we had to carefully coordinate the movement of the two, two ROVs. Sometimes they were working together, sometimes working separately. Um, so as I mentioned before, seven digital steel cameras on each ROV were capturing photos every five seconds and most of the time 3D high definition um, being captured from the two vehicles as well. So at the end of the mission we had over half a million photographs, around 300 hours of high definition video and much of that in 3D and uh, about 50 terabytes of data um, we, we wheeled off the vessel. Now I'd like you to give you a little bit of an insight into some of the material we collected. This is just in 2D for the moment. We do have much of this content in 3D, but we're still going through the process of um, processing um, that data. Um, this is the B turret on the HMAS Sydney. With this image here, you can see the, uh, the deadly accuracy of the German gunners. And uh, the top of the, uh, the turret was blown off there and disabled that uh, particular turret very quickly. This is the stern on the HMAS Sydney. You can see the other ROV working above it. Um, it was quite a, um, a unique opportunity to have two ROVs working on site. So you could actually film one ROV with the other ROV. So you could provide context as to the, the actual operations that were taking place. You can see the, the compression damage that's occurred as the ship has sunk. Um, it's become squeezed by the uh, incredible pressure at that depth. This is looking into the, the guts of the torn off bow of the, the Sydney, looking over the shoulder of the ROV. You can see some of the anchor chains, the torn metal. You can even see some of the rusticles that um, you'll have a little bit more of a closer view there from a little bit later. You can see the lights on the, uh, the ROV there and, and some of the cameras. So um, the, the bow, which is this section here, is sitting upside down on the sea floor. Um, so um, in contrast to the, the hull on the Sydney and the hull on the, uh, the Cormoran, 
Both of those are sitting upright, whereas the, the bow is sitting upside down. This is an item from the debris field. It's a, uh, a life raft, um, something called a Kali float. Um, obviously significantly degraded in 70 years. It's not something I would have wanted to have um, tried to survive in. It's um, um, essentially a, a wooden slatted floor which is connected to the, the buoyancy ring by a series of ropes. The bottom of your body would be essentially sitting in the water, so uh, um, you know, hypothermia would, would eventually set in very quickly. This is from the Cormoran, um, a very different site quite pretty in some ways because of these uh, sea anemones. Um, we're still sort of working out our, um, our, our measurement accuracy, but we, we think those, some of the large ones at least, are in the order of 20 to 30 centimetres in diameter, almost alien-like. Um, you can see the original paintwork on the cormorant. Um, you can see some of the rusticles just there. The two ships are in amazingly good condition despite having been in the ocean for 70 years. Um, that is in part due to the fact that they've been sitting so deep and uh, the water at that depth is, is essentially very oxygen starved. As I mentioned before, the Cormoran was carrying around 300 sea mines. Um, most of them were detonated when the, the ship was scuttled. Um, this one obviously didn't. Um, we kept our distance when we saw this one, but took lots of photos. You can see that this sea mine itself has um, incurred some compression damage itself um, as it's uh, sunk with the vessel. This is sitting on some of the, uh, the torn up debris sitting in the debris field. And this is my favourite image from the whole collection. Um, this is one of the guns on the, the Cormoran. Um, it shows the amazing clarity of the water that we were um, um, blessed with that day. It also shows the, the sharpness and the clarity of the photography. You can see the, um, what's called the rifling in the end of the barrel there. That it gives the, uh, the projectile a, a, a spin at the end to improve its uh, accuracy. It also shows a bit of the personality of the crew on board. They've named the gun Linda. There's also some German text around here which very roughly translates to mean victory for us and death to the enemy. And of course the skull and crossbones for added effect. All right, so we mentioned that we uh, took a lot of photos. And uh, why did we take so many photos? Well, it's for the process called 3D reconstruction. Um, this technology is, is making so many um, inroads into so many fields. Um, the, um, the plenary talk just earlier um, on optical, coherence to optical coherent tomography also talked about using 3D reconstruction and is a, a very um, uh, capable and fast developing field. And it's, it's one of the technologies that we're um, uh, making uh, very good use of in this, in this project. And the purpose of 3D reconstruction is to generate 3D models from a series of 2D photographs. So this image here shows um, um, one of the ship's boats. Uh, these were not lifeboats, these were intended to transferring ship, uh, sorry, um, personnel and uh, stores between ship and shore. And each of these um, blue rectangles here with a, a black line sticking out of the back of it represents a camera image. So uh, um, we flew the ROV down and went around it once, sort of like doing a pirouette around the, uh, uh, around the, um, the item, and then also did a second one at a, at a different height. So uh, um, essentially we, we photobombed the, uh, the site. Um, the process of 3D reconstruction, it's also known as uh, 3D photogrammetry or structure from motion, and it's primarily based on the use of still images, but we can also use um, um, frame grabs from the video um, sequences as well to provide more coverage if we need it. It's a, uh, a shot of the, the same image just from a different angle. Um, what we do need is lots of, um, lots of angles, good coverage um, to enable us to generate high quality models. It's stuck. It's stuck. There we go. 
So the actual technique of three direction reconstruction, let me tell you a little bit more about that. Um, every image has to be um, uh, have a process of features identified in the image. Um, then those features are matched between photographs. So every photograph is compared to every other photograph. And, oops, sorry, wrong button. Um, each of these line segments here represent a matched feature in one image joined up with a matched feature from the other image. Um, those matches are then put through into a, um, an algorithm called a bundle adjustment, um, which allows us to calculate where all the cameras were and also generate a very sparse point cloud. Um, people often ask, did you have to have accurate tracking on the cameras? And the power of this approach is no, you don't. The positioning of the cameras is actually determined from the subject that you're filming. Assuming that the item that the subject you're filming is not moving, um, you can determine very accurately where the cameras are positioned when they were taking when they were taking the photograph. From that, once we know the, the camera positions, we can then back calculate and perform a denser match and generate a much denser, denser point cloud. So these are all points in 3D space. We can rotate that around and see all those, those points in 3D space. Um, an algorithm, another algorithm is then applied to um, produce a mesh over the surface of the point cloud. And then finally, the images from the cameras are laid back, projected onto those surfaces to provide a photographic texture to those models. So what you've got then is a very accurate digital 3D model of um, the item that you filmed. And all of this process is fully automatic. So all of the 3D models you've seen, you have seen in the documentary so far, and I'll show you in a few moments, are all completely automatic processed. We haven't done any uh, post-processing um, or uh, human in the loop at that, this stage, but um, uh, we will be using that approach to improve the quality of the models. So these, uh, this is actually two, two of the ship's boats sitting above each other. Once you've got a digital 3D model like this, there's a lot you can do with it. You can uh, produce a stereoscopic video like this. Um, um, we can also go to uh, um, techniques of 3D printing to generate physical reproductions of the artefacts from the sea floor. So you can see that the top boat has had a catastrophic collapse. There's another boat sitting over the back there. These aren't in um, accurate um, placement of the original location. Now we're flying across to a reconstruction of the, uh, the bow of the Sydney. And along here you can see some of the, the rusticles that are um, hanging off. This is all generated from the 3D models. And if I had my uh, um, supercomputers, not supercomputers, but um, um, uh, visualisation machines here, we'd actually be able to fly through this in real time. It's quite an uh, empowering process to be able to just fly through and just explain different items to people as they ask um, in a, uh, quite an inter interactive experience. So we spent probably an hour and a half photographing just the bow, uh, I think around 5,000 images, and uh, that's allowed a, a, a very complete model of the, uh, of, of the, uh, the bow itself. Um, the boats are showing quite a lot of degradation. Um, they're made of wood, so they're uh, being eaten away and, and degraded very quickly. Um, the Sydney itself, though, is, is in remarkably, remarkably good condition. So where to from here? Um, we've got lots of data processing ahead of us using the 3D reconstruction software. Um, we're quite privileged to have access to the fastest public access supercomputer in the southern hemisphere, just across the road from our university. It's called the Pawsey Supercomputer. Um, and we're using that to generate the, digital, the 3D models of items from the debris field and also, hopefully, fingers crossed, the full main hull of both wrecks. These um, The results of the, um, the project will be developed into museum exhibitions, which will be shown at uh, the WA Museum. Uh, they've got several locations in, in Western Australia, as well as partner institutions. 
um, around Australia. And uh, we're also hopeful that there, there may well be some um, institutions in, in Germany that might be interested in taking it on. Um, as I mentioned, the 3D documentary feature that's been produced by Prospero Productions. There's also a range of research outputs of the project. Um, a number of the aspects of this project are really on the, the bleeding edge, and when I mean bleeding edge, I'm being bleeding, uh, bleeding truthful as well. Um, so the 3D reconstruction techniques and also the processing of the science samples are, are leading to some um, very solid research outputs as well. <coughs> 